want to begin to pray. Can we begin to speak in tongues? And ask that the Lord open our hearts to receive. It is one thing to hear. It's another thing to understand. That's why Paul prayed. That I pray earnestly that the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened. That you might understand. So we are going to ask that, Lord, I don't just want to hear tonight. I want to understand. Jaka bande supra dengia sai. Jemi supra dunde shai. Jakata bande mus. Rasheka dondia. Ziku ve bonde sahamahaya. El gamende sokievai. For you, you to be glorified, you be lifted up. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted up. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted high. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be Unto that your heart cries as a youth that you want God to be lifted high, you want God to be glorified in your life, God cannot use you. You need to understand that every service in this kingdom is for the glory and the praise of His name. And so, Lord, I ask this moment, the people have gathered here before you to worship. It's not me, they have come to meet, they have come to hear from you. And I ask humbly, Lord, that you use me as your vessel to preach your word in the name of Jesus. For in Jesus' mighty name of prayer. I want to begin by thanking the leadership of this church, the senior pastor of the church, our dad in the Lord, and our, our, our pastors. I also want to thank the youth leader for giving me this um, avenue to, to, to preach. To the, to the body of Christ and I really appreciate it and I pray that as we have as we have come here we're going to be blessed in the name of Jesus I will be preaching on a topic I titled uh, the mystery of sustained revival the mystery of sustained revival there are revivals and there are revivals that last there are revivals and there are revivals that make impact in a generation, in a land. And I'll be talking about that because that is one of the things God wants to charge us to do in this youth weekend. That we might arise and go out to revive the land, to revive our territory. In this teaching, we're going to be examining the life of a very strange man called Elijah. We are going to be moving through the sequence of his life from the moment he appeared to the moment that leads us up to our scripture which is which um which takes the theme of our mess of our program can we open our bibles to first kings chapter 17 verse 1 first kings chapter 17 from verse 1 i would like anyone to read First Kings chapter 17 from verse 1. Just verse 1. Just verse 1. Thank you very much, man. He said, and Elijah the Tishbites 
of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain this year except as my word. This man appeared out of nowhere and came to confront a king who was famous for his practices against the Lord God. He came out of nowhere and just came to appear to the king and just told him that the Lord has said, except at my word, there shall be no dew nor rain. There was a call upon his life which he answered to. I want to put it to each and every one of us that there is a call upon our lives which we must answer to. There is a defined purpose for which each and every one of us are here upon this earth for. We are not just here by chance. We are not just here to live freely. We are not just here to move through the moment or to go through phases in life and just grow old and die or enjoy. We have a specific purpose for which God has created us for. There is a call upon each and every one of us and until we answer that call, we cannot really feel purpose. Yesterday in the seminar, our youth leader was opportuned to explain to a lot of us what purpose entails and how to find our purpose. The processes, you know, discovery, preparation, implementation. And he explained to us the reason why we have a purpose on this earth. And this is under charge again that we need to understand we are not just here by chance we need to understand that god has created a purpose for us and until we come into the fullness of that purpose we are not living as we should can we also open our bibles can we continue down from that same first king 17 if we move to verse 2 i'll read from here from verse 2 to verse 6 then the word of the lord came to him saying Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook, brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and the bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. I the chariot experience that's point two the chariot experience chariot is spelled c-h-e-r-i-t-h the chariot experience if you go into the etymology of the word chariot that's the historical meaning of that word it means a separation chariot as a word in historic you know historical meaning means a separation there were many prophets in Elijah's time. There were many prophets who have been prophesying, who have appeared. It was even there was even a contest during that period. They were, the Jezebel was then slain, the prophets of the Lord, and you know there was there were prophets during that time. But when Elijah appeared, he had answered the call of God. He had come to meet Ahab and say, "Yes, Lord, I've answered your call, and I have gone to face the evil king, and I've told him your word that there shall be no dew nor rain." The next thing God said is, yes, I'm separating you. Go to a solid... Chariot is a ravine. It's a wilderness. It's not a place where people have it. It's a wilderness. And God said, yes, I want to separate you. You are not going to be like any prophet. You are not going to be like any writer. You are not going to be like any musician. You are not going to be like any talented person, any football star, any actor, any actress. You are going to be separate from me. So come now, go to the book of Cherit, the place of separation. Let me groom you. And what does Cherit signify? Aside separation, aside God calling to be separate, it's a call to walk in signs and wonders. It's a call to shake the world. It's a call for revival. We are going to examine two people who God also separated. In Acts chapter 13 verse 2, Acts chapter 13 verse 2. And as they fasted, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work I have called them. When God calls a man, if you examine the lives of these men afterwards, you will see that they began walking in exploits. 
the Paul we know, this is where we, he began his, his exploits from. Separate me. Separate me. When God calls you, he doesn't call you to follow the pattern which others are following. He doesn't call you to follow the his, his, his laid down rules which others are following. He calls you to be separate. To follow a different life entirely. A life that is hinged on his word. A life that is separate. And when you are called into that life, there is certainly a manifestation of exploits, a manifestation of signs and wonders that will follow in your life. What does Cherito also signify? Cherito is also a place of hiding. Hiding. Cherito is a place of hiding. When God calls a man, he doesn't just throw him out. Oh, move. I want to give an instance of a, a military barracks. When they recruit soldiers, they don't just put them on the war front like that. They keep them. They keep them for months. Months on end. They keep them there. Hide them. Then when they are ready, they are released to go to the war front. If you recruit a soldier and put him on the battlefield, that day he will die. Many of us, we are called by God. We know our gifts. We know our talent. And yes, we are so eager. We have been charged. We want to go out into the world and manifest. It's true. There is a time for that. But before you can move and move effectively, there is a place of hiding. There is a place where you are kept. That is why he said, go to church. Church is a really fine. A place where that is scarce of people. People are not there. Church is a solitary place where you will walk only with God. Hearing the voice of God day and night. That is what charity signifies. It is a hiding place where God cooks those he will use to shake the nations. Where God cooks those he will use to birth revivals. And that is what charity signifies. What does charity also signify? Charity is a place where a man will be subjected to a total dependence of God, upon God. Charity is a place where a man will be subjected to total dependence on God. Imagine someone places you in a desert. No source of human connection. No source of life. And says, I will provide for you. It is the point where it removes you from everything you feel is yours. It removes you from all your strengths and places you alone and says, depend on me. Have faith in me. I will take care of you. Have faith in my word. Believe in me. I will take care of you. It doesn't sound sensible that God will tell you to go to a place that beds will be bringing food for you. In a drought period, this is not a period of plenty. A period where there is serious drought, no rain, and he says, go there, beds of the air will bring food for you. So it takes total dependence on God for a man to obey such kind of call. But that is the call of chariots. God is calling you to chariots. He says, it's a time I have called you. I have given you this gift. I have given you this talent. This is the mechanism through which you will shake your nation, shake your territory. But come first. Come and learn of me. Come and depend on me. Because it is through your dependence on me that you will go far. If you do not learn this in the place of chariots, when you go out there and you begin to face the winds and the waves, you will begin to shake. Your faith will shake. But if you have been in chariots and you have survived in a wilderness, where you survived on nothing but the mercy of God. Where he's the only one who fed you and you were steadfast to it. When the winds and waves face you in the battlefront, you'll be like, yes, you come and laugh at me, but I have a God. He does not fail me. He has never failed me. He won't fail me now. That is why you must not skip any process. Charity is an important process in a man's life. Charity is also a place where your faith is built. It is a state where God takes the steering wheel out of your hand and enters the driver's seat and says, Chill, let me drive. You have been driving your life for too long. You have been moving around in circles, moving here and there, exploring the world as youths. Beautiful. But if you are coming to chariots, give me the driving seat. Give me the wheel. Let me drive you from now on. Where I say you should go is where you go. Where I lead you is where you go. You will not go where I did not tell you to go to. And that is the experience of charity. Charity is a place that every youth that God must, God, that God is going to use must come to and stay for a while. It's not a place of forever. 
it's just a place for a while where you are baked you are cooked as a sharp instrument for your nation and i pray that the lord shall allow us to stay in charity in the name of jesus i was opportune to learn from one of our pastors here pastor Bayer de Bakin, who taught me a serious revelation that has helped my life since then you know if you are like me you have many big visions and talents god has shown you so many things you have seen where you are going to it's beautiful and you have even started the process you are energetic you are all charged up and you know you have come into a place not knowing what to do okay how do i go about it so i was as he's, he's, he's opportunity has been god has used him to be a disciple so far so one of those times i went to meet him i asked him sir this 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 what's your guidance how do i achieve this that god has been showing me i've been seeing these visions and he gave me a secret he says take one day at a time one step at it that's the work of faith the work of faith yes he has shown you the big picture but don't lose sight of the day today do not lose sight of the day the bible says he brought him in his food morning and evening the ravens could have brought a big supply of meat and dumped it there and said okay for the meantime of this drought be taken from here be taken from here. but no he said every day non unfailingly they brought the meal every day unfailing they brought the meal that is the work of cherries the work of one step at a time do not lose your sight of of the daily tax god has brought to you when you focus too much on the picture picture yes he has shown you that big place is taking you to he has shown you that you will ride upon the world the world will fall at your feet you will dominate the earth yes it's true but he has told you also today and do that praise worship today be in that media today play that piano for that church yes you'll be the best instrumentalist in the world we're going to be the guitarist that people will you will play and people will cry but play for that church first today play for that church for that bible study for that prayer meeting play for that church for that sunday service do not neglect your duty yes your voice will make people fall to their knees will raise the dead will heal the sick but sing in that sunday worship service come for that choir rehearsal do those little things be dutiful to in them do not just do them because you have been told to do them do it with passion the way you will do one thing i told myself is that the way you will do it when you get there do it the way you are doing right now the way you will handle with all your energy with all your creativity with all your mindset when you get to that destination that you desire that god has been showing you do it now first for the bible says who is faithful in little more will be handed on to him if you are not faithful in the little things today he gave you a task you are not faithful in it tomorrow he gave you a task you are not faithful to it he spoke to you today you're not here you are focusing on yes he said you take me there you take me there no you won't get there focus it is on the journey of life as you take a step yes this step today this step tomorrow and you keep moving and you get there that is the work of faith that god has brought us into he says do not worry about tomorrow when you start worrying and worrying and worrying you will lose sight of everything that is dear to you and that is the work of charity the work of a day-to-day -day life now going to the third point the zarephat experience the zarephat experience zarephat is spelled z-a-r-e-p-h-a-t-h we are going to be doing some um dictionary stuff so let's listen if you go to the etymology of zarephat the etymological meaning of zarephat it means a workshop for the refining and smelting of metals zarephat etymologically is a workshop for the refining and smelting of metals it comes from the Z, from the verb saraf saraf is spelled s a r a p it comes from the verb sarap which means to smelt to refine and to test it comes from a verb saraf which means to smelt to refine and to test the bible says there were many widows in jerusalem there were many widows around the land but god said no the widow i want to take you to is the one at zarephath in sidon go there let's read luke chapter 4 verse 24 to 26. luke chapter 4 verse 24 to 26. luke chapter 4 verse 24 to 26. then he said assuredly i say to you 
no prophet is accepted in his own country but i tell you truly many widows were in israel in the days of elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout the land but none of them was elijah sent except to zarephath in the region of sidon to a woman who was a widow now before we go further when you check the historical landmark sidon was the hometown of jezebel sidon was where jezebel came from and god said for you to be refined go to zarephath in sidon where jezebel who is wrecking havoc who is killing the prophets of the lord who is serving Baal, who has torn the hearts of israel to against the lord go to that same sidon to a widow there where i will train you where i will refine you this shows us that we used to say there's something that we used to say that um the generation before they had they were not they, they, there was no more so much evil in their land you know they didn't have the access to internet and you know things that we have right now that the evil in our generation is very serious and that is true our generation is a very perverse generation but it was in that perverse land the the, the origin of Jezebel that is where a man was refined for the Lord's use he's trying to tell us that no matter where you are don't say my location is what is causing this is where I am the mindset of these people around here has influenced me uh, no God is telling you in the heart of the heart of evil I can refine a man the man I will use how to be trained in Zarephath of Sidon the hometown of Jezebel he had to be trained there to show that wherever you are the Lord can train you now what is the Zarephath experience the Zarephath experience let's open to our Bible to see them the, that first Kings again chapter 17 let's go to verse 14 now first Kings chapter 17 from verse 14 and it says for those here the Lord God of Israel the bring of flour shall not be used up, nor shall a jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain upon the earth Zarephath experience is an exposure to an oil that never runs dry to an oil that is where the anointing of the Lord comes upon you where the infilling of the Lord where you are living at the Lord's expense where he begins to build you up because the expense of the Lord when you are surviving at the expense of the Lord it is exactly what Elijah said it shall never run dry so they were feeding on oil and flour they were feeding on the expense of the Lord feeding on the word feeding on the things that God was imputing into him and they never ran dry so Zarephath is the place where you are there's, there's something you call input output if there's nothing input you cannot output anything so Zarephath is where you go to to be equipped to be for things to be put into you that you might output later on if there's nothing input into you you don't if you go and just manifest when the world look at you okay what do you have to offer you have nothing you have nothing but your vain strength and your vain might but when you stay in the Zarephath living on the flow of God's oil when the oil of the Lord is pouring into your life over and over again day in day out morning afternoon evening and that is what you are sustaining by an oil that never runs dry and you are living by that you are infused with various things that will help in your manifestation later on Zarephath is a place where God puts into you the arsenal that he will use to launch his attack on the territory you are going into. A soldier that has been prepared for a battle, he kept in the barracks. When they are sending him out to the forefront, the first place they go, they go into the arsenal. They pick weapons of war. They pick guns, pick daggers, machetes, knife. Equip themselves to face the enemy. Equip if a soldier goes out without a gun or anything, he will be killed at the war front. He might have received the necessary training at the Book of Chariot. He might have received all the training on combat, on warfare, 
at the brook of chariots but if he does not go to Zarephath, the arsenal where we will receive the input the, of the arsenal that he needs to fight he will still die that is the issue with a lot of people as well you might have received the necessary training discipleships we have received the wilderness experience but we have refused to be equipped with the necessary arsenals that will enable us to wreck havoc, havoc in the camp of the enemy and that is what limits us when we go finally for mass manifestation we are we don't have anything to offer because there's not nothing has been imputed into our hearts and that is the Zarephath experience and every soldier for Christ has to go through every youth have to go through the Bible says um, the, the, sorry there's a song that says my worship is my weapon to us worship might be just there, but worship can be a weapon but if you have not stayed in Zarephath worship will remain just lyrics to you it is those who have stayed in Zarephath that the worship is converted to a weapon that when they sing principalities bow when they sing demons are cast out when they sing when they worship God they don't have to lay hands on anybody just the sound of their voice strangers shall hear their voice and they shall flee from the hiding places why they have stayed in Zarephath and they have been equipped with the asset now that when they open their mouth it's not just lyrics that come out bombs rocket missiles are coming out to attack the enemy and that is the place we must go for that's the place we must go to we're moving on let's move on to the mount camel experience the mount camel experience we're going to first kings 18 now if you read first kings 18 and you read the whole of no, it's all the way to verse 50 40 you will see the manifestations of god this is the when you are being cooked you will you will you will be almost invincible when obediah met in this passage you see when obediah met elijah in verse 12 he says and it shall come to pass as soon as i'm come as i'm gone from here that the spirit of the lord will carry you to a place i do not know so when i go and tell here and he cannot find you he will kill me. Elijah began to teleport. He had stayed in chariot. He had stayed in Zarephath. And when he emerged, he emerged a new man. He emerged a weapon of mass destruction. Teleporting here and there. Even when he was about to move and Elijah was to take over, he was famed for teleporting. When he went to challenge the, challenge the prophets of power, that was the next step. He was coming out a weapon of mass destruction. He challenged them. 450 against one if you if you look that look at that on a normal standpoint of view you gather 450 men against only one person how does it how rational does it seem but he knew that those that were with him were more than those that were against him he had understood that from the chariot and the Zarephath experience so he was confident gather all the prophets of Baal let's see whose God is the God is the one true God and he put it to them they shouted they cried they did all their oblations and sacrifices and um, Elisha mocked them. But like, maybe if you cut yourselves and uh, you know, do all your wishes, you, you, you will get more results. And they did everything. And when they have finished, spent themselves, he stood up. He was a man that understood the time. The time God moves. You see, at the time of the evening sacrifice, he learned that from the Zarephath and Cherith experience. He didn't just stand up at any time and walk out and just manifest. He knew the time when the Spirit of the Lord will be moving, when the hand of God will be ready to strike. And he stood at the time of the evening sacrifice and he said, Arrange the bulls. Now, I want to also bring out something that a lot of us probably may not have noticed. He said, He said, Fill a jar with, um, so, with water. He said, Yes. Fill four water pots with water. Now, I need us to understand that there was no rain for the past three years. Yet, they were able to create water. They were able to get water for them to fill four water pots in a land where there was no rain for three years. Where even the king was looking for water to feed horses, not even human beings. The king was looking for water to feed horses. Yet, when he climbed on the Mount, Cam on Mount Camel, at the time of his manifestation, water came out from nowhere we do not know the origin of the water but we know that there were four water pots that were filled and were used to make a mockery of god's bow and at that evening sacrifice 
he spoke to the Lord. He said, Lord, verse 37, hear me, Lord, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the bond sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up all the water that was in the trench. That is what a man who has stayed in the Mount Camel, who has stayed in the Zarephath experience, who has stayed in the chariot experience. That's what he can do when he comes out. When he comes out, the impossible becomes possible. The supernatural begins to manifest in various dimensions. He, be, he can challenge a whole army. We see something killing 1,000 men with a drop on away. Those are not ordinary feats that a normal man can do. But when you are empowered of the Lord, when you have stayed, you will see that those feats become ordinary to you. So now we move on to verse to First King 19 from verse 1, which will be the focus of our teaching today. Okay, he said he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me more so if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. This was a man that could teleport. This was a man that killed 450 prophets of Baal. This was a man that stood upon Mount Camel and called down the fire of the Lord. This was a man that scattered things, shook Israel. And yet one woman said, she didn't just threaten him, I will kill you. And he, he was afraid. Not just that he was afraid, he ran, leaving his servant to show what the kind of fear he had. So why did Elijah run from Jezebel? It's a question that we need to understand. Why was Elijah running from Jezebel? And that is what will lead to the crux of our message, which will make us understand the mystery of sustained revival. Like I said before, there are revivals that start, that start and there are revivals that are sustained. Why did Elijah run from Jezebel? We need to understand something that Elijah as a person is not just the human being we know him. There is a spirit of Elijah. And that spirit of Elijah is what we call the spirit of revival. If you read Luke chapter 1 verse 17. Luke chapter 1 verse 17. I'll read from here. And he, let's start from 16. And it would so many of the children. Okay, sorry. Okay, let's start from verse 15. For we will great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. They will be filled with the Holy Spirit influence from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord of their God. And he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and to the disobedient to make the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Elijah's spirit is a spirit of revival. Elijah is a spirit of revival. That when the Lord notices that a land has been plagued with evil, it has been plagued with corruption, he sends the spirit of Elijah in the embodiment of a man. We see it, not just in Elijah, we see it in John the Baptist too. A man just strange, just strange in their ways. And the spirit of Jezebel in the spirit of the Antichrist. Everything that is against God, she supports. Let's read 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 31. 1 Kings chapter 16. Now, the children of Israel have been called as 
the children of God. They have been called to worship God. And we see here, he said he came to pass as if it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam. He took the wife of Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. They turned their hearts completely away from God and worshipped another God entirely. That is the spirit of the Antichrist. It is the spirit that plagues generations upon generations upon generations and it keeps growing in size. It is a spirit that fights against God. It is a spirit that, that goes against anything that makes reference to God. And anytime God notices that it is very prevalent, his response is to send a spirit of Elijah. So, the reason why Elijah ran from Jezebel, he had come to a point where he had made an open mockery of Baal. Baal normally, according to history, is known as the god of rains and fertility. But he came and said, by my own god, there shall be no rain. Let's see what your Baal will do. And truth, truly, Baal was put to shame. He went again, went to the mountain, called 450 of their prophets, asked them to put a contest. Let's see who's God. He had shamed Baal completely. He had hit them. He had rattled the camp of the enemy. He had shaken every, every foundation that was set. And yet, a woman still stood and said, I will kill you. A woman still stood up. I want to give you this scenario. Just imagine you were put into a boxing ring. You are, you are a trained fighter. You box this person. Box, 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 box. Use all your skills, all your techniques. Hit him here, left, right, center. And with blood dripping from his mouth and his nose. And he smiles at you and says, I will kill you. How will you feel personally? You have expended all your techniques. You have manifested all the training you have been trained to do. You have expended everything. And when you have finished, you have shown, yes, I'm the better fighter. I have fought and fought and fought and blown and blown. And you see the blood coming out from the person. But he's still standing. He says, you, I will kill you. You hit him again, hit him again. You, I will kill you. How will you feel? As a fighter, you, what, what do you want to do again? At that point in time, Elijah, even the great Elijah, became afraid. He said, ah, what's this? What, what, what have I come to confront? And if you move on in that passage, he says, but he went himself a day into the wilderness and came and sat under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And it is enough now, Lord, take away my life for I'm no better than my father's. I want to talk about the juniper experience. It is an experience that every man that will sustain a revival must come to. The juniper experience. When he went to a juniper tree, he had expended everything in him. He had finished his armory. All the bullets are finished. You carried your gun. Blah, 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 blah. You finished everything. Your bazooka, you launched it. And the enemy still stood and said, Ha, ha, ha. I will kill you. And he was, okay, what next? He went back to God. That was the next step. And said, Lord, now take my life. I'm no better than my father's. Then as he slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. You would think that, because at that point, he was terminating his own ministry by himself with his own mouth. Lord, I'm true. I'm, I've tried. I've tried my best. I'm true. You would think that God will be angry with him. That after everything I've shown you, after all the manifestations in your life, and I've done all this and done all that, you would think that God will be angry with him and tell him, okay, yes, yeah, you're yeah, done, you're yeah, done. Let's go, let's go. Let's move on to another person. But God said, no, that was not what God did. He said, this is what he said. He said, as he slept under a broom tree, he said, suddenly an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. Arise and eat. 
before we progress to what that arise and it means i want us to understand that in that experience of when jezebel was threatening him he said jezebel sent messengers to elijah why didn't she send soldiers to go and kill him right away because she was powerless she couldn't really do anything to elijah all she wanted to do was shake his faith in god threaten him and see let this man give up and he responded exactly as she would have wanted she knew where he was all the while but instead of sending a battalion of soldiers do that the fire of god will roast them she sent messengers let me shake this man's faith because i know i cannot touch him he is anointed of the lord he has been equipped with the armory but he doesn't know something that there is that he doesn't know something so let me come in this manner instead of attacking him straight on let me come in this manner and shake the foundation that keeps him firm in this battle let me shake his feet and she shook his feet and said you i will kill you the lord has been protecting me all this while immediately he forgot and he ran and left now what god understood was that god said to him no I, like i said before you would think that god will just write him off and okay you have ended your ministry with your own mouth i'm not using you anymore but god said no he says don't give up don't give up when i built you as a man i built you you were not designed by your own strength to run a revival you were not designed in your own might in the energy of your bones in the energy of your your own being you were not designed to run a revival but if this revival must be run you need to eat something you need to partake of something that will give you another fashion that will enable you to push this revival through the scripture says those that wait upon the lord they shall renew their strength the additional meaning of renew doesn't mean there was no strength there there was strength there but it finished so they have to come for another strength that will enable them to move on a revival i want you to understand as youth you cannot run a revival or anything by your own strength you will come to a point where you will be diminished you will come to a point where you will be cast down because if you run it it is not a one time thing the enemy must have looked at him and said me that i have been there from the beginning let me see how long you can last with your own strength but when you went to the juniper tree God did not write him, but he said, come, arise and eat. And he says, when he, there, he looked, there was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. So the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose, ate and drank. And the same man that was afraid and tired of everything went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. Now, what 40 days and 40 nights means that he was not sleeping. He was not resting, he was walking 40 days and 40 nights straight up. He was resting, he said, okay, walk for 40 days. 40 days, night and day, he was walking for 40 days. A human being. Now, I want us to understand, what is that food that he ate? What did this Elijah eat that made him to just... <laughs> he walked for 40 days and 40 nights. And if you look on, as we will we'll be studying, we'll see other things that he did. What is the content of that food that Elijah ate? See, if you read Psalm 72, Psalm 78, verse 25. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted up. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted high. Verse 25 says, says, men ate angels' food. He sent them food to the full. If you read from, from the beginning, you will see that he was talking about the children of Israel. That he rained manna down from heaven. And that manna was angel's food. 
now I understood why the children of Israel could trek in the wilderness. If you know what a desert is, scorching sun, sand that will be holding your leg, and they trek for years without dying. Trek for years. Their sandals were not worn out. Their clothes did not spoil because they had eaten a food that equipped them in a supernatural way. Because that was the food that was available in their time. The food that was available during their period was the angel's food. So the Lord knew, I did not build you to run on your strength. You were built to be continually dependent on me. So now that you have come to a state, you have understood your insecurities. You have understood that I am not effective. I'm incapable. Now is the time I can give you the, the food you can eat that will enrich you and give you a strength to trek for 40 days and 40 nights to do the impossible to surmount mountains to go and to keep going this was the food that the Lord gave Elijah but in our time we have a more beneficial food in our time during their time what they had that God could give to them at that point in time was the angel's food. Can we read John chapter 6 verse 30 to 38? Therefore he said, they said to him, what time you perform that then we may see and believe? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in this desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to you, Most assuredly, I say unto you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to them, Then he said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. I. In the time of Elijah, there was no Jesus. So the Lord knew that for this man to sustain this revival, I must introduce a supernatural factor. But there's no Jesus at this point. Take angels' food. But at our time, the Lord Jesus has come to redeem us. He has come to die for us. And he has presented himself and said, Here I am. I am the bread of life. Arise and eat of me. If you move on, he says, He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Let's now move to verse 48. Verse 48, he repeated again. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. That one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which comes down from heaven. Just the way the manna came down from heaven to feed the Israelites. The angel food came. Now we have a more sure food. Jesus came down as a bread. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for my life of the world. Then the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say unto you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood and by, abides in me, and I in him. And the living Father sends me, and I live because of the Father. So he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your Father who ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now I want us to also understand something else. In the beginning, we hear that the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the next thing, the earth was without form and void. There was a gap in the middle. And theologists have believed that that gap was the part where the Bible says there was war in heaven. There was war in heaven. So this war we are fighting is not a war that just started in your generation. It's a war 
of an ancient foe. An ancient foe that has been defeated, which is just a matter of time for it to be manifested. It's going to be manifested at the end of times. But he has been defeated all this while. And he knows he has been defeated. He knows that it is just a matter of time before he is defeated. So he cannot harm us in any way. He knows that he, 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 we have defeated him by the blood of the lamb. We have defeated him in every manifestation. So what he comes to check is, when you blew him, you say, I am still here. Although I have been defeated, but I am still here. That act is to shake your feet. Be like, ah, I punched this guy, he's bleeding. But he's not falling because he has been defeated already. So what he does to a revival when he starts, is that he attacks the sustainability. If men are running on their strength against this ancient foe, they will fail. He said, even the youth shall fail, and the young, the young men shall utterly fall. But those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Because you are not designed to run this way by your own strength. You are not designed to push this revival by your strength. The battle, actually, is to stand and not fall. The only time you lose is when you fall down and do not rise up. When you fall and you stand up again, the battle has continued. But the time the devil defeats you completely is when you fall. You say, okay, yeah, he hits me. I've done all my arsenals. I've prayed and fasted. I have spoken to these people a thousand times. I have ministered to these people a thousand times. I have healed the sick in this region. I have raised discipleship. I have healed men and women here and there. And yet, they are still stubborn hearts. I have raised banners of Christ everywhere. I have done the impossible. And yet they are still stubborn hearts. I have done everything. And the devil still laughs. The principality in that region still laughs. And says, ah, ah, ah. I will kill you. All those are mere bluffs. He cannot harm you. What he's trying to harm is your stand. How long can you stand for? Is there, the, 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 the principality is telling you, I have been here from the beginning. Although it's a matter of time, but I've been here from the beginning. For you, how long can you stand? How long can you stand your ground and say, as long as surely as the Lord lives, I will face you. As surely as the Lord lives, I will face you. That is the reason why we need to eat. Because there's a sustenance. The revival we think is not one, woo, one wind comes and everybody's just changed and the lives are just yes things happen like that the church can be transformed totally by just one move of the spirit but that's not the revival we are we are, we are talking about here this revival is an age-long revival a revival that preceded us a revival that we still remain even after we are gone what matters is our ability to stand till the end of time and we shall say like paul i have fought the good fight i have finished the race Paul did not go to all the churches there. Even in the churches Paul preached, you could still see him complaining in his letters that people were still singing there. This is enough to discourage a man. That's what the enemy does. He just wants to discourage you as a youth. You will push and push. Speak to this your friend. Speak to that your friend. Do this, do that. And you see things are not really changing. It's just discouragement. Paul, the apostle that we read of today, in the churches he preached, the churches he labored, we still see people singing there. But he was unwavering and stood to the very end. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. He had his own race. You have your own race. You cannot finish the whole work of revival. It is in seasons, it is in stages. Everyone has his own part to play. Do your part and stand to the end of time. And what is the way we can stand? We can't stand by our strength. Yes, we are youths. We can pray for 10 hours. We can pray for 8 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. We have the strength. We have the energy. But we finish. One day is you come. You, your energy will finish. It was that energy that finished that made me go and meet my pastor by your said, Sir, I have run. I have run this. I have run in this way of writing. I've run in so many ways. And my energy has finished. And he gave me an advice. He said, It's not really about boom, one big. You don't just blow like that. It's the process. Day by day, eat. Day by day, arise and eat. You see them. Elijah arose and eat. And he lay down and slept. Say, come. That food you ate is not enough. Eat some more. 
eat some more. If you are going to Abel Kuta, the fuel you use is not the same fuel you use if you are going to Bini. If you are going to Lekki here, the fuel you use is not the same if you are going to our house here. You gather fuel. You eat. You eat. You eat. For the journey is far. For the journey is far. I want to let you know, do not look at the lives of other people around you. Do not look at the lives of other people. Your journey is individual. It is different. The journey you are going through is different. Your mates may have been manifesting right now. Your mates might be manifesting. But I want to let you know that Jesus was hidden for 30 years just to manifest for 3 years. He was hidden 30 good years to manifest for only 3 years and that was the end. But the impact he made surpassed all the prophets that lived hundreds of years, all the Methuselahs and everybody else. Just a 3 year journey that was built from 30 years. I learned something from my Apostle Jesus Sam, and he said, if a dog is pursuing you, the same energy you used to run when a dog is pursuing you is not the energy you used to run when a lion is pursuing you. The ferocity with which you will run when a lion is chasing you is very different from the energy you used to run when an ordinary dog is pursuing you. Some of us, by the leverage and the grace of God, that the mercy that God has shown us and blessed us, our parents are, you know, yeah, they know God, they brought us up in the ways of God and they have taught us the life of God. But there are some people you know, your fathers were not born again, your fathers were not believers, and you want to compare yourself with someone whose parents have been following the path, who they have paved the way from them. Those ones probably is just a dog that is pursuing them. But you, your fathers have been serving idols. They have been living bad life. They even have covenants that are speaking against you. And you want to look at that say this guy doesn't pray that much you know i can i can't i can you know i can follow that pattern of life hey you you will you 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 will you will, you will learn so many things my friend there's one of my friends he looks at me every time he says i envy you your parents are missionaries you have so many things set out for you say me i know the battle he's one of my friends he's one that he helps me my feet he says, i know the battles i pray when he's praying for three days stretch i know why he sees me praying for six hours. He cannot see. Okay, this boy is praying for six hours. Let me just go and join him. He prays, he prays three days stretch. I'll look at it. Yes, I know. He say he knows why he's praying for three days. The battles we are fighting are different. Our individual races are different. We are not called from the same purpose. The training of a plumber is not the same training for an astronaut. This training for a normal mass, mass con training is four years. Medicine training, eight years. Why? They are two different. One deals with life. And that deals with speaking. Your individual races are different. So the process God will train you to be different. Don't use your friend to gauge your life. It's an individual race. Look to God, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't look to your friend. Don't look to that man of God. Look to God, who is the author and finisher of our faith. And that is what will enable you to run this race effectively. It is a race, like I said, it has been there before us it is here now and it will still be here before what we have been called to do as youths is to run it in our time the fall is not falling it's not you can't go and meet the devil and say hey, boo, 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 and you fall immediately in your front no it doesn't work that way it's an ancient fool it was there before you'll be there to the end of times so it's not a one-time hit and go it is a constructive consistent persistent battle that can be only sustained by eating if you go in your might you will feel if you go in your strength you will feel whatever field god has called you to be it acting speaking writing music there is a foe in that field there is a challenge in that field that you are going to confront so when you have built your arsenals you have stayed in the chariot you have stayed in the in the um, Zarefa. even when you launch out to Mount Camel, always remember that there's a juniper tree that you must go to from time to time unless you will fall and never rise again. It is okay to fall today. The devil will bring you say you, you say you are an evangelist, take fornication is in your life and you fall today. He has only defeated you when you stay in that sin of fornication. But you stand and shake it up and say, no. 
yes i have pushed on for this while with my strength let me go back again lord jesus this thing is still there feed me enrich me that i might stand and fight again that i might go back into the field and push harder the devil might smile and say you you call yourself a prophet you call yourself a great musician that people will fall under your anointing take pride and you stagger and you fall but you say no i'm standing up back on my feet again and i will go back to my juniper tree and i will eat and when i eat i'm coming back for you although this battle will not end but i will fight it till my own race ends the others that are ahead of me will run more the others that are before me have run years this is my time it is our time as youth now we are here in this generation to run our race this battle will not end now this is something that discourages a lot of people you see you have been pushing in ministry a lot of your people you have been pushing in ministry pushing and you're not seeing the results you desired just the fact that you are feeling discouraged shows that you are making impact the devil does not discourage people that are not making impact it doesn't come for you if you are if you are idle and you're not doing it you're not affecting it. enjoy live your life but the fact that it's coming to discourage you and attack you and it's putting affliction in your life is attacking your family it's presenting that child's school fees to you that you cannot pay it's presenting that those oppression from your boy that you cannot match up to it's presenting all those things to you is to show that yes i have something i'm i am i'm doing something it's not it's not it's not it's not a a, a, a futile battle it's not a one hit and run it's a trade of blows we are blowing each other and that is the fight we must fight till the end of time we must fight and press on and press that we may stand at the end of time and say and say that i have finished my fight so like i was saying we are concluding now the food we have now is jesus it is food we must eat right now we don't have angels food anymore but the food of god the food which is god is more beneficial than any food you can eat there are many foods <laughs> the world you offer his own food that if you eat of it, if you eat the world, ah, you'll be a superstar in the world. The devil will offer his own food. Eat that food and see how it will blow. So there are many food, but the foods that we must eat in this kingdom is one, which is God. Jesus is the food. He is the manna that has come down from heaven in our time. He is the source of our renewal of strength. He is the source of our renewal of strength. God knows your strength will finish. He knows. He knows you will run and come into a place where you have expended all your energy. He knows. He knows you are a human being. That is why he has made this allocation that you might arise and eat some more. Don't worry, soldier. You fell down today. Pick yourself up. Let's forge on. The battle is still long. We are fighting a long battle. That's what the, the journey is long means. The battle is not a, it's not the end battle that comes. No. It's a long battle that we have been fighting since I was going to fight. It's the meat we can partake of to be empowered to walk in this supernatural we see the disciples of jesus christ when they partook of the meat unlearned men their shadows began healing the sick men who were fishermen they had not gone to any school they began preaching and five thousand souls we give at, at a time we give their life to christ these are men who ate of this food they arose and ate they did not look at their insufficiencies and stay down there were times when God, Jesus expected them to heal the sick. Say, oh, you of little faith. How you have been with me for so long. You can't see who the sick. At that point in time, the devil might have sneered at them and said, see your life. You can't heal the sick. After all this, why you have been with the, with the son of God. And if they wanted, they could have, uh, okay, I've tried my best and rest. In the sheep, all they have seen Jesus' miracles. In the sheep, their faith will still shake. Because the waves and the winds are moving. But Jesus will always say it, O ye of little faith, come, let me show you. And he always steal the storm. He's always there. He will always heal that sick for you. He will always steal that storm for you. Even when, although you have seen his mighty hands, and you come to a stumbling block, and your faith is shaking, as long as you call unto him, he will always walk on the sea, and he will even beck on you. Come and walk with me on that sea. That sea you are scared of. Come and walk with me. Yes. Let's soar over the waves together. The roaring waves of your life, the roaring waves of your challenges. Let's walk upon it together. It's the meat 
it, we can partake it. Finally, it's the meat we can partake in to silence every Jezebel in the land. The last scripture we are reading, 1 Kings 21, verse 25 to 29. 1 Kings 21, verse 25 to 29. I'll read from you. Okay. But there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord because Jezebel his wife stirred him up and he behaved very abominably in following idols according to all that the Amorites had cast out before the children of Israel. So it was that when Ahab heard these words that he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning and the word of the Lord came unto the Israel, Elijah the by saying see how Ahab the people were threatening you see how they have humbled themselves before me because you went to that juniper tree to eat and when you came back the word of the Lord came unto you again and you went to see me that same Ahab but this time you were not running on the food of your belly you were running on angels food so when you spoke this time it was a different manifestation. He had that was uplifting himself. This time he humbled himself, went into sackcloth and mourning. The, the, that is the promise of eating Jesus. That our, if our, in our insecurities, he will stand strong for us. He will empower us to do the supernatural. This is the meal we can partake of to keep on going to the very end. And we pray that the Lord shall help us. Can we arise on our feet and begin to pray? You will always be a child in my hands And when you need some love, my hands are open wide Even when you're growing old, I hope you realize That you will always be a child in my heart. Oh, you will always be. You will always be. You can always go back to that tree. You have not outgrown eating from Jesus. Keep going back. Keep going back to eat more. No matter how old you have gone, no matter how far you have gone, there's always a space to come back and eat. Even when you're going old, I hope you realize that you will always be a child in my head. Can we begin to pray now and ask the Lord, Lord help me. For some of us, it might be that we don't even know the call of God upon our life. We have not known where God has called us into. If that's your case, Ask the Lord this moment, Lord, show me what I am made for. I know I have not come to live an ordinary life. I know I have not come to live anyhow. Show me the path which you have destined for me. Show me the path which you have forged for me to take. For some of you, it might be the chariot experience that you have been running away from. If you are like me, you have been charged up and you want to run to the field. But there's a chariot experience you have left. We need to ask God, Lord, help me to stay in the book of chariots. For some of you, it might be the Sarah experience that you refuse to go to. And when you went to the manifestation, you had no arsenal to present to the enemy. Ask the Lord, Lord, equip me. I am coming back to the arsenal ground. Give me the equipment I need to go to Mount Carmel. And for some of us, it might be that we have been equipped. We have stayed. We have stayed and now we have run on our energy and we have come to a point where we are tired. We are tired of running. The devil is staring at us. He's afflicting our children. He's afflicting our lives. He's shaking our foundations. Everything we are doing is afflicting us. And we have come to a point where we are tired. Ask the Lord, Lord help me to arise and eat more of you. Help me to arise and eat what will sustain me to the end. Help me to arise and eat some more. Some of us might have eaten before, but there's another bread. The journey is long. Eat some more. Eat some more that you may not be tired. Shakabad and Nosaya. Redededen Shakabad. Shakadeba Nosiabala Kondes. 
Prie pour que bon You will always be a child in my hand.